you're watching later and can't see the, the Zoom comments, the tasting order will be the Glen Geary, 10-year-old, the Del Yui, 97, 25-year-old, the Equinox and Solstice, Ben Nevis, 2012, seven-year-old, the Orkney Sponge, number two, 2005, and then the Orkney Sponge, edition 306, and finished with our peated favourite, uh, Coila. Edition 66, 12 year old. So I think uh, everyone's here. I've had a few um, apologies sent the watch re recording. So I might call a formal start to the tasting tonight. My name is Oliver Mruda, and we've got Emma Cookson, our whiskey specialist on the whiskey list, joining us tonight. And then obviously the legendary uh, chief whiskey executive from Decadent Drinks, Angus McRaeld, uh, joining us tonight as well. Angus, how are you going, mate? Yeah, I'm doing very well, thanks. Yeah, busy, busy. Lots of uh, lots of uh, grappling around with labels and bottles and the usual um, hullabaloo of trying to do independent bottling. Uh, but uh, we're getting on lots of nice products coming up on the horizon. And uh, yeah, just really nice to be here. Always uh, humbled and appreciative that you guys uh, do these tastings with our bottling. So very cool. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. And just before I hand over to Emma to, to run us through tonight's tasting, uh, some very exciting news. More Whiskey Sponge is coming, so we'll have a shipment hopefully in the next few weeks for Christmas. Uh, the big call out is uh, we're not just calling it Whiskey Sponge anymore, and Angus will explain it a little bit more, but it's Decadent Drinks is the parent company, and Decadent Drinks expands, it like encompasses the Whiskey Sponge, there's Whiskey Rum, there's Arminac, uh, you've got Orkney Sponge now, you've got Isla Sponge, you've got Equinox and Stol Solstice, you've got Equilibrium. And the newest one is NAS, capital letters NAS, which doesn't stand for what I originally thought it was. It's Notable Aged Spirits. And that, that the two um, whiskies that are coming in there, uh, including a very exciting um, Ben Nevis that I can't wait to try. I love a good Ben Nevis. Uh, they are on the boat right now. Or actually, they're being air freighted in. Um, we, we couldn't wait six months we said it needs to be here for christmas so uh they'll be here in the next uh week or so um so yeah we'll, we'll obviously email everyone out as soon as that stuff lands and, and keep up to date but yeah thank you um so much to all of you at home for supporting um the growth of decadent drinks in australia and at that i might just hand it over to to emma and angus to, to take us through tonight's tasting cheers everyone yeah thank you everyone especially the familiar faces for coming out i I know that, uh, you know, we don't need to delve too much into who Whiskey Sponge is anymore. I think most people are, are pretty familiar, um, but I would love for you guys to pour out your Glen Geary. Um, and for those who haven't tried a Glen Geary before, it is pronounced Geary because Gaelic is the worst. Um, and it took me like a whole year to find out. Um, but yeah, while you're, you're pouring that one out, I might get Angus to tell us a little bit um, behind, I suppose, kind of the the more you know decadent drinks, the whole vision. Because I know that it's not just spirits. I think he bottled a wine as well. Yeah, we did a wine as well. Yeah. So when we started, so the origins of of us doing bottling at all, the is really we started as just a, a kind of hobby bottler, like a lot of um, bottlers start. It was um, it, so my main business partner Ian who runs a uh, whiskey auctioneer and he'd done some bottling under a different label called Copper Monument and he'd had some mixed results with it and when it came time for him to start thinking about doing some more bottlings he reached out to me and said you know we've done this but we'd like to take a different approach do you have any ideas would you like to collaborate and it had been at the point where I was thinking it might be fun to do a cask for the sponge at some point or do a whiskey sponge bottling but it was just an idea. I had no idea about how to go about that. I didn't have the cash to buy a cask or anything like that. So I said, well, coincidentally, I've been thinking about this. Why don't we do a, a sponge bottling? Mm -hmm. And then everything just sort of evolved from there. And after a few months of doing that, we'd had quite a lot of success and it you know, seemed to be uh, well appreciated. So um, we thought, well, let's start a, a proper company. Let's uh, move from just being a partnership and start a proper company and do this sort of more seriously, more professionally. And uh, that's where I came up with the name Decadent Drinks because I was very conscious that I didn't just want to do whiskey. I liked the idea of doing other spirits, but also, you know, we did a wine eventually, I'm hoping to do another one sooner rather than later. And we also thought about doing things like beers and ciders and, you know, 
just a whole range of kind of craft drinks really that's the, the vision long term and uh, we focused on spirits primarily because obviously that's what sells and that's, so that's where we get our our cash from in order to sustain ourselves but long term i'd like to add in other drinks as well but uh, obviously whiskey sponge evolved and we had this i had this concept of the sponge universe um which was whiskey sponge and anytime we got a new spirit we would do armagnac sponge or cognac sponge rum sponge and this was a lot of fun and it still is a lot of fun but um you know over time uh, i want to do add in new brands like we've just added in notable age statements as oliver mentioned and early on we introduced this quarterly series called equinox and solstice which was really about i had this so essentially i'm um you know i come across as a kind of high functioning whiskey geek but really at heart i'm just a big hippie that likes to be out in forests sort of sauntering or sauntering around nibbling on mushrooms and just being very deep and philosophical about the world and listening to trippy dippy hippie folk ladies from the 60s and stuff like that so i thought let's have a series which is all about nature and art and um natural malt whiskies and the seasons certainly in uh, this hemisphere and this far north we really notice the difference in the seasons a lot and uh, a lot of sort of um you know a lot of the very ancient history of these countries goes back to celebrating the solstices and the equinoxes so this is where this idea came from so we release on the actual um spring equinox uh summer solstice autumn equinox winter sol solstice every quarter we release a seasonal uh, bottling and so this one we're about to try the glengarry uh, 10 year old is the equinox and solstice summer release from this year and so the, the concept behind the series is that i'll pick a uh, I'll try and do a small batch single malt bottling, which is at the more affordable, accessible end of the price scale. And it's always bottled at 48.5%. And it's designed to be a sessionable and uh, very easy drinking bottling, and one which the flavor suits the kind of mood of the season. So with this one, it's two first fill barrels, and they're married together and reduced to 48.5%. And it's meant to be something which you can just pour in a big tumbler, have a big dram, have a sip, share with friends. It's not, they're not overly complicated whiskies. They're designed to be sort of one big, simple boof, bash of flavor in the mouth, just be satisfying, pleasurable to drink and something you could easily put in a highball. I always, this with the summer bottling, I always try and pick something that I think would work really well in a tall glass with ice and soda. So just like a really refreshing, quite classical, simple way to drink malt whiskey. And um, I'm not, I'm not a cocktail person, really, but I do love a good highball. And I think certain malt whiskies, kind of simple, quite robust flavoured ones, do tend to work really well. And I tend to pick Highland malts uh, for the series Equinox and Solstice because they tend to be the more kind of charismatic distillates that deliver these kind of quite specific, punchy, clear, individualistic flavour profiles. So Glengarry, really lovely modern highland style malt whiskey in that it's quite textural it's big fat spirit uh, it works really well at this age just 10 years old 22011 first fill barrels as i mentioned so the wood is there in that it gives us nice supporting uh, rounded sweetness to the profile but you still get lots of distillate character these kind of slightly more flinty waxy characteristics these little impressions of like olive oil grass and um, this this nice natural sweetness of the barley so one of the key characteristics that I always like to retain for most of our equinox and solstice bottlings is this impression of the raw ingredients coming through. Often, you know, with, with the summer and sort of spring editions, I like to have whiskies which give you a real sense of, you know, raw ingredients, barley, uh, that kind of impression that you're getting like a barley eau de vie, or you, know, you, you can taste the malted barley as a component in the, in the spirit. So with this one, um, we did... Uh, yeah, so Glengarry, and then the next one along, which we'll taste in a minute, um, it's quite good to taste them in order, actually, because I think you get, hopefully, a clear sense of um, how they differ from season to season and, and what I'm trying to achieve with the flavour profiles we're looking for. Um, and with these series, we do a different artist every year. So um, the first year, uh, it was a friend of mine, I just asked her to do the labels, um, a girl called Kat, who's just sort of a, like a hobby artist, but she's very, very good, does lots of different styles. And, and so I just gave her a pitch, which is 
do four artworks that express to you what each of the individual seasons mean to you. And that's the same pitch we give to every artist. So I've just done that for um, next year's set of Equinox and Solstice uh, releases and picked a new artist for that. This year was um, another friend, another um, female artist who lives and works in the Highlands called um, Melissa Nash. And she did a series which was really very different. Um, Cats was very kind of impressionistic and just like very kind of mood themed ideas about you know colors and uh, vibes about the season and um, Melissa did something really along the lines of Celtic mythology she's really into like me you know just dancing around in forests and uh, sort of hippy trippy um, Celtic Pictish stuff so she did a really wonderful and um, playful series looking at uh, themes of Celtic mythology and that's the other thing about the series is that you know I try to move it away from uh, traditional whiskey uh, marketing and imagery and stuff. I want it to be something that really stands out and feels different and has quite a high concept approach. The, um, you know, you a lot of traditional stuff out in whiskey presentationally, I think, is very boring and very conservative. And I think you can see that with everything we do. It's all about original artworks alongside hopefully very high quality liquids inside the bottle. And so with sponge and uh, and now we also have notable age statements. Um, these are our more kind of fun, humorous, playful series. Obviously, Sponge is very, very much about surrealism and silliness and kind of crazy labels. And Equinox and Solstice is more serious. And, you know, I put little mini essays on the back labels as well. So the Sponge labels have all got stupid, totally random tasting notes or nonsense on the back. Equinox and Solstice is more kind of serious, wordy mini essays themed around nature and the seasons and all that stuff so you know we really go to town and uh, try to do something different with these things and yeah it's just uh, i would say it's our more serious seasonal uh, quarterly bottlings and i'm very pleased with them so far i i love the whiskies um they're a little bit more low-key everyone sort of focuses on sponge but they're bottlings which i am really proud of and over time once we start to see the full sets line up year by year i think it'll start to be you know, hopefully the concept comes across quite strongly every year, you know, the more it sort of accumulates like that. Um, so what do people think of the Glengarry? How is it? Um, great tasting notes. And I'm, I'm glad that, put your hand up if you've never had a Glengarry before. Let's see in the chat. Oh, most people have had Glengarry before. That's, that's exciting. I, I think I've only had one before. Mm. Oh, we got one hand up. Yeah, it's, it's one you don't um, typically see in Australia very much. I have a massive soft spot for it after I brought back like a teeny tiny bottle from my one trip to Scotland back when I didn't drink whiskey. So I have this absolutely bizarre and nonsensical attachment to the distillery. But um, I love the, what people are saying. Definitely lemon and vanilla um, on the nose from Leo. Nice body with a light oiliness. Yeah, I always get this like lovely floral you know, those like old little soaps that you would have in a bowl that weren't for using. You weren't supposed to wash your hands with them. They were just like soaps that sat in the bathroom. Um, uh, usually like flower shaped. It always reminds me of that. It's weirdly nostalgic. Um, we got a uh, typically syrupy, spicy orange on the palate, um, good stuff. And Keenan has a question. How do you find the outturn varies with the equinox and solstice? Because do you do any single casks in the equinox and solstice or is it typically like the vetting? Oh, sorry. I guess you're on mute for some reason. Don't know how that don't know how that happened. Um yeah, we uh we do tend to do uh, small batches with them. Um it depends. So for some of the ones where like the the winter one coming up uh, this year is going to be uh single cask and the winter one last year was a single cask because get, to get so for winter is where I deviate and I just look for dark juicy unctuous sherry I want pure Christmas cake in a glass for winter uh, just a big hug of sherry and so with that it's kind of um, it's kind of tricky because uh, you tend to be dealing with butts and butts are just mahusive so <laughs> especially if you're reducing to 48.5 percent you're like 800 bottles so what i've started doing as we'll talk about with the next one is i sort of chop them in half sometimes and do half at 48.5 and then the other half we'll do a cast strength or a different strength and use it for a different bottling um last year we did a really beautiful krigelichi 
2006, I think, as a 15 year old. And that was just a hogshead. So that was perfect. Beautiful first Phil Sherry hogshead. And then with this year coming up in December is a Mortlach 2012 that spent two years in some very active fresh sherry. So it's actually a double matured Mortlach, but it's got really classical, big sort of like bouillon broth soup bones juicy dark gungy witchy hat uh, mortlach so it's uh, it's very classical and and really ticks the box uh, so we've done that was a massive cask so again we've done the same thing which is split it in half so the other half i don't know i'm going to do with it yet but the 48.5 uh, percent of it will be equinox solstice winter this year um Generally, though, for the rest of the year, it's often small batches. And I usually try and make the outturn above 500 bottles if I can. Certainly above four usually. But um, going forward, what I want to do, um, it's the one series which is designed to be scalable. So I really would like to be able to get it to the point where we can do at least like a thousand bottles with every release. And um, part of our efforts now really with um, developing new channels and new markets, uh, you know, is to be able to have... Um, the room and the space to to do larger batch releases like that because especially when you're playing with casks being able to do two or three casks and certainly once we get our own warehouse to be able to start doing proper marrying and uh, like re-racking and not just re-racking like um like other people tend to do where it's just like a finish they'll put some bourbon into a fresh sherry you know i'm much more interested in using like really neutral wood to to marry things and use and create space to have for air and oxygen to have an impact on whiskey and to oxygenate spirits and all sorts of weird, funky, strange stuff that they do in places like cognac and like bring those practices into Scotch whiskey because I think there's so much space to do you know creative things with that. So that'll all come in in the fullness of time. Maybe next year's series you'll start to see things like that coming through. But yeah, usually it's small batch and usually it's around about kind of four or five hundred bottles. Um, so with the next one, uh, good to I was compare them. Ask. Did you want to, right, considering no. you were saying that, you know, the the story between the, the Glengarry to the Ben Nevis being, because the Ben Nevis is the autumn release, is it? Yeah. Did you know what? I had forgotten that we put the W in second. So I had yeah. my Do we want to swap it. it to the Ben Nevis and go to the Ben Nevis second? Yeah, if, if, people are, if people are okay, to, if I'm not like chucking an enormous spanner in everyone's um, <laughs> tasting lineup, but uh, yeah, that would be no, cool. No, no. Um, just follow the pagan think, traditions <laughs> yeah i mean i'm i'd love to be able to say i'm a pagan i'm not i'm just i'm just a part-time pagan um so <laughs> hobbyist pagan uh so yeah the ben nevis <laughs> so the glengarry i think you think about it hopefully when you taste it you it's quite clear that it feels like a sort of summery whiskey um it's autumn right now in uh, in the uk and i don't really know if you have an autumn in australia um we get quite quite good quality autumns over here it's very uh, very beautiful right now and very sort of chilly and blustery outside so think about that sort of weather and that kind of um mood when you try the ben nevis because the ben nevis is one where it's moving up a scale in terms of weight and power in terms of it being you know, you've gone from the east highlands which is still a reasonably robust type of highland style whiskey in glengarry it's 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 got a bit of waxiness it's got a bit of weight and texture in the palate but the glengarry sorry the ben nevis is a step above that and the ben nevis has some sherry influence because it's spent all its life in a second fill sherry butt and a really good quality one so i think this is a great example of how um when you have really good spirit it doesn't need to be old to be you know really good quality and it's a massive cast this and only seven years old but already i think it has really good um character and weight and body and lovely uh you know fatness in the mouth it's a very very um it's an almost industrial spirit ben nevis like you when i knows it and this is not just this bottling but many others i find these characteristics of like old toolbox rags and mechanical oils and workshops and like you know it's sort of like every every dad's workshop in existence you know smushed down into a spirit format and, you know, the sort of impressions of hessian and camphor and all these lovely things, which I really like. And the sherry, I think, adds to that because it's quite a, even though it's a second fill, it's still obviously quite a active sherry profile. So 
it brings in these kind of earths and tobaccos and chocolates and spices, which really complement complement that weighty distillate character. So I like this because you have sherry character, our favorite Japanese whiskey. Yes, absolutely. So you have this sherry character, but you also have the clear Ben Nevis distillery character. So it works really well as a combination. And for me, this is like a an autumn warming dram. It's a big hug in a glass. And it's the sort of whiskey which you could, you know, work your way into with a knife and fork. Very chewy, very thick in texture, big body, very satisfying whiskey to drink. And again, I come back to this idea that it's not really a whiskey for, you know, nosing and dissecting. It's not super complicated, but it's a sort of whiskey that if you sat down with a friend to watch a film or you snuggle up on the sofa at night, whatever, you pour a tumbler with a big inch of this stuff in it. That is a satisfying, pleasurable whiskey experience. I'm a great believer in this idea of, you know, stepping back a bit from the geekery sometimes and just remembering that this is just a drink to be enjoyed. It is there to give, deliver clear, powerful, simple pleasures in life. And sometimes, you know, moving away from the sort of nerdiness of it and just remembering that it's something to give you relaxation, you know, to sip away at while you're reading a book or listening to your favorite music or watching a film or just switching off from the sort of intensity of day-to-day -day life. That's what the Equinox and Solstice whiskies are really designed to deliver on. Um, whereas, you know, you go to the kind of single cask world of, of sponge, then that's where it's more about nerding out and sitting around with your friends and analyzing and getting all overly intellectual and silly. So, you know, it's 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 really designed to meet that other aspect of whiskey, these bottlings. And I think the Ben Nevis is probably one of the best examples of that so far because um, it ticks so many of those boxes in my view. So I hope that it's it gives you a good sense of what the series is about because I think the the difference between these two, the Glen Geary going onto the Ben Nevis, is very very sharp. Like it's a real handbrake screech from summer into autumn, in my view. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it and. Uh, yeah, and so the other half of this butt, by the way, this is half the cask. The other half is bottled at full strength, 100 proof uh, for the notable age statements bottling, seven-year-old notable age statements, which is the other half of this Ben Nevis cask. And that, the reason we did that partly is because to sort of split it up a bit, but also the whiskey works very well at a higher strength as well. And if you ever get to compare them, I'd be very interested to hear your feedback because the seven-year-old, um, 100 proof version under the NAS label is a different beast entirely. It's much more powerful and it's really like a proper slap in the chops. So if you're looking for something with a lot of power that doesn't necessarily contain peat, that's a very cool bottling. Um, yeah. We did them both on the stand when we did Whiskey Live in Paris and a lot of people trying both and there was really good feedback about just what a, what a difference it is to try them at different strengths like that. So um, yeah. We can't wait to, to try the new Ben Nevis NAS, but I just wanted to highlight these are the two labels for those who at home haven't seen the Equinox and Solstice labels. So uh, Whiskey Sponge always has a character on it and, and a little bit more uh, satirical or surreal um, label. The, the Equinox and Solstice are these beautiful artworks. So they, they're the two bottles that you should be looking at for the, the Nevis and the Glen Geary. Um, I love the, the label in the Glen Geary, the, the, the redhead riding the deer. It's, it's very yeah, cool. they're they're it's very um sort of it, it, like it's it's proper kind of pagan hippie level stuff uh, which which I love and I I like the fact that um you know we don't go to the same sort of there's sometimes people use these sorts of themes as well but they they try to sell the bottle along with a big story and say oh this is the story about you know. Olaf the, the Hairy, who once rode a horse through the enchanted realms of Ochterstrudel and whatever, just total bollocks. And we don't, we very consciously just say, look, we've just done a nice, pretty artwork. And these are the sort of themes and moods this bottling's about, but it's also very much about the whiskey. There's no story, there's no labored artifice. It's just trying to strike a balance between saying, we're trying to do something a bit different. We're trying to do something that is dare I say it, a bit more kind of sort of, I don't know if I want to use this word or not, but maybe feminine. I don't know. We've, we've worked with three, three female artists so far. And I think we'll continue to do so for this series, but it's very much trying to move away from the kind of boring, staid, conservative, blokey, incredibly unimaginative world of whiskey labels, which seem to exist 
many other places in whiskey and uh, i'm very keen to continue with decadent drinks to to move away from that and push back against that because i think whiskey generally is you know traditionally historically there's been some beautiful labels but there's not been a lot of like evolution um, it's still quite a kind of traditionalist conservative often quite boring world when it comes to presentation and you know people think that just increasingly large ornate silly boxes is what they need because i don't know but I, in this world i think where you know materials and packaging and all these things are coming under more scrutiny and um, i like the limiting aspect of just a basic glass bottle with some labels what can you do within that space how creative can you be within that those parameters i think you know creativity thrives with a little bit of confinement and a little bit of limitation and that's really um, very much what we are about at Decadent Drinks. Um, so anyway, uh, any last comments on those two first drams? Um, yeah, it's going to drop a year old a run for its money. That's cool. Yeah, um, Leah saying that it's been, it's, the whiskey has been tamed without destroying this distillery character. And I completely agree. It's like, you know, you get those Ben Nevises that are just like big and bold and, and intense and they're amazing. But sometimes you want something a little bit easier. I get so much like, um, like roast chicken at a Thanksgiving dinner, which I know doesn't make sense because it's supposed to be turkey. Um, but that fattiness from a roast chicken is like really what I, I totally, I totally get what you mean because um, that kind of like uh, cured meats or bouillon stock or like slightly earthy umami flavor that, yeah, gravy. It's a set, I mean, the Ben Nevis could work quite well as gravy, I think, so. <laughs> That's, I think it's a very <laughs> sensible act, comparison. And then someone cool. says, feminine orientated, you won't be donning a Panama hat anytime soon, Angus. Well, do you know what? It's probably it's probably quite a good idea. I would happily walk around a festival with a Panama hat on just to see what sort of feedback <laughs> I got. Um, it's just, I don't think I suit a Panama hat, but then I'm not sure Jim Murray suits a Panama hat either. Um, I'm not sure Jim Murray suits anything except like a, an Ewok outfit. So anyway, yeah, we'll see. Possibly watch this space. Yeah. Um, so should we move on to the uh, Dal Ewan? Dal Ewan, yeah, I think so. Yeah, cool. All right. So um, I'm a big fan of whiskies. I've, I've probably said this a gazillion times in these tastings. I like whiskies which have distillery character and have personality and don't just taste like wood. So obviously I'm a fan of refill casks and um, I'm a fan of Dal Ewan. Dal Ewan is probably one of the like mid tier in terms of how well known it is space side names it's not particularly well known it's not particularly pushed as a single malt by diageo in its own right uh, for good reason because they like it a lot internally as a blending component it sits somewhere beneath klein leash in terms of weight but it sits above a lot of other space siders i think it's one of those ones that's more like a kind of medium to full bodied space side style so you have a bit of waxy texture it's often the sweetness in it is often more like kind of fat and thick. And it's just one of those whiskies that has a bit more of an edge to it, I think, than a lot of space ciders. So we tried these stocks when I was sort of rummaging through um, rummaging through Signatory's warehouse, looking for new bottlings. And there was this parcel of Dalu in 1997 hogsheads. And they're all of this character, all really lovely. They, you know, they'd matured very nicely to sort of under 50% alcohol really great age 25 years old full term and pretty gentle refill hogsheads so you have this maturity but you don't have um much wood influence in the sense that it's not too tannic or spicy or peppery you've just got this wonderful like unfolding gentle little wave of honey and uh, like heather honey and like soft yellow fruits and again this sort of natural malt extract barley sweetness just underneath that so i love the way that this whiskey was just really rounded, naturally sweet, still rather full. So the sort of honey and wax combination, um, it's just really lovely character. And that's why we decided to do two hogsheads. They weren't super full. So I thought we can do two together and just both were pretty similar. So even if I'd done one on their own, I think the whiskey would have tasted roughly similar, but I just thought I want more, more bottles. <laughs> so we uh, we decided to do uh, do two together, make it a small batch bottling. So I'm really happy with the whiskey. Um, really, uh, really lovely uh, and just, yeah, very gentle, 
easy drinking, 25 years old, perfect sort of age for these kind of whiskies. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy with this one. What do what does everyone else think? How's your first impressions of this one? Yeah, Mike says beautiful floral nose. Chris, interesting how a sweetness can feel this fatty. Yeah, I I've always described that textural sweetness from Daluan as like jelly beans. You know, mm -hmm. like the texture when you lick a jelly bean or you bite into it or something. It, it's there's the viscosity to it through the sweetness, but it's not like yeah a, a different kind of syrup or something like that um our pet code definitely get a lot of confectionery notes in it like this you know you say jelly beans i, I frequently find the like little white pineapple jelly bean things yes. that are always getting up in these sorts of whiskies yeah so i've just got ollie to pull up um a, an image of the label for this one which says you will end at edition one yeah no one believes it and everyone thinks everyone so thinks it's a joke it. but but it is, is that why strange. you make so many like uh, sub edition releases? Are you just trying to delay the inevitable? No, that's just that's just because I am a whiskey geek, and I think, oh, it'd be cool to do turn these two casks into three bottlings, or oh, these are a pair. We should do these together. Isn't that cool? And it's just that when I try things, I get ideas, and I think, oh, th this would be cool with this label. Let's we'll have to do two labels. We'll have to do two bottlings. And then everyone sort of in my team like rolls their eyes like this is going to be so complicated i guess and I, I know but think about how cool it'll look on the shelf when it's finished um uh, so no the, so the whole edition 100 thing this was not something we decided at the outset but it was something that i kind of arrived at in recent times where i was thinking i really like doing this but it's quite creatively challenging and i don't want to do it for so long that everyone switches off and gets bored or that I start to find it really a slog to come up with these new sponge labels because to feature a character like the sponge in everything is is very fun but has its own certain limitations so it was really like a a creative thing I thought let's make the series limited and make it just 100 a lovely round number even though it's way more than 100 when you include all the a b c all and all the like little exclusives and the Orkney sponge, the Isle sponge. Yeah, there's loads of them, but 100 is a nice round number. And I thought, let's let's finish there and then we can do something else. Uh, so I do have a plan for a follow-up series after that, which will share many of the similar properties. It will come from the same mood universe of sponge and it will still embrace silliness and surrealism and fun. Uh, but that's all I'll tell you right now. But there will be something following on from it. But my my uh, you know intention going forward is really to make decadent drinks the company, the kind of focus of what we're doing, and to have you know our, a clear um, organization of our brands under that. So we have the sponge bottlings, equinox and solstice, and notable age statements. Don't have plans to add to that at the moment, but there'll be a bit of a reorganization once we hit the end of sponge around. Uh, we'll, we'll, at the moment, what the plan is we'll probably hit edition 100 around September, October next year. So keep your eyes peeled then because uh, there will be, uh, and we can probably do some quite exciting uh, tasting or something to showcase the new series. And I think there will be some very sexy whiskies for that. So hopefully I'm, I'm working on it. Um, so the, yeah, the, it's really a, something which is, I suppose, is a commercial imperative behind it because we don't want people to get uh, bored of what we're doing or to become so many bottlings that everyone kind of just loses focus and switches off but for me personally it's very much a creative thing I don't want to burn out I don't want to get um sort of creatively bored or exhausted um because I you know I'm it's me that's really designing all the labels in terms of imagining and thinking up what's going to be on them writing all the rear labels and that's when we do this many bottlings it's quite a big job but I still love it and I just want to be able to keep that aspect fresh and set ourselves new challenges. I don't want to rest on our laurels, get lazy. I want to, you know, we're a creative company and I want to set ourselves, uh, you know, challenges and keep ourselves kind of sharp and focused on that aspect. So that's the reasoning behind it. But there's going to be quite a lot of, uh, there's still quite a lot of very fun and silly sponge bottlings in the works between now and then. So, uh, and then sponge will, of course, become a heritage brand. He'll retire to the world of t-shirts and posters in the sky. 
<laughs> so uh, and it's not going to go away forever. Um, yeah, so the do, 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 do any other comments or more like gummy bears? Yes, there's, there's that little emoji there, which would suggest, uh, yeah, okay, I don't know, gummy bears, different kind of gummy bears, perhaps. Balance, hints of nuts and honey, yeah, sweetness, honey, floral notes. Yeah, everyone's finding honey, um, yeah. probably because I mentioned it early on and now it's all in your brains, power of suggestion. There, there um, is this like back note of uh, like home, like old school English lemonade on the finish that's just following through that I'm really loving. It's like a dirty lemonade, um, but Dirty yeah. lemonade, that dirty sounds lemonade. like something I would have drunk at university. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I know what you mean. plastic receptacles. <laughs> slightly lemonade that's begun to slightly ferment. Yeah. Yep. And yep. I think I know what you mean. And then someone said talking about Ben Nevis is an addition 58B in the pipe works. Yes. So the other half of that cask, the 58A, was um about half a butt of Ben Nevis reduced to 53% and bottled. Then the rest of that liquid is still in cask. I'm going to leave it for over a year more to in an effort to get more oxygen in there and see what that does. It's a bit of an experiment. I'm going to bottle the rest. I've decided we'll do the rest at cast strength and we'll just whatever comes out will be the bottling. And I, uh, I don't know, it, it may just be that it tastes like a slightly stronger version of 58A, in which case you all feel like I've conned you slightly into buying the same whiskey twice. <laughs> but that's the risk I'm willing to take. Uh, so we'll see what happens but that the plan is that that may well be one of the very last bottlings of sponge because obviously the theme if you looked at the first label is young sponge interviewing someone uh, and I think you can probably guess that old sponge will be appearing on the front label of that one and answering the questions posed on the rear label of edition 58a so I'll see what I think the answers to those questions should be at the time we bottle that cask and then we'll <laughs> we'll write that down and you can all find out. So maybe around about um, sort of September, October time next year, we'll we'll put that one out. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> interesting. I actually have a sample of that one since since we bottled it. I, I was at Whiskey Broker and I took a sample and. Um, yep, still pretty similar. <laughs> Don't worry, bigger, bigger companies have gotten away with the same thing. You just look at the, you know all the different Johnny Blues that are still just Don Johnny Blue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, it's, yeah, it, it's also a very um, divisive bottling, that one. Uh, and I knew it would be because you say 25-year-old Ben Nevis, and of course everyone gallops to hoover it up, 25-year-old yeah, Ben Nevis, but it doesn't taste 25-year-old. It's very pure and very, very raw. And it's like real distillate driven. I, I love it because it is naked Ben Nevis. It's like, bullet naked extremely um focused on all those like oily mechanical components i mentioned about the spirit before along with like really zingy tropical fruits but it's also got a lot of very funky stuff going on in there we had someone email us saying did you bottle this by accident this is terrible and and i wrote back a, a detailed and polite response saying no no I, I i appreciate that you don't like it but you cannot like everything we bottle and uh you know i I am interested in bottling things which I love, but also things which I think are quite extreme and will provoke a response in the drinker. So that means that not everyone will love everything we do, but hopefully most people will at least really like most of what we do. So that's the theory anyway. But yeah, come back to me in like two years and see if that still stands up. Yeah. Um, we, with the shipment of um, the ones we're tasting now, so obviously we're trying to get as many on... Um whiskey bars around Australia to take up as much of the, the decadent drinks portfolio and, and to, the, to their efforts they are. I've never seen bars fight over a 25 Del Yui. Like it went like hotcakes. People were lining up. I've got a backlog. We've got a few more bottles and uh, backups. Uh, Angus has managed to find some in these yeah, archives. Yeah, I remember you more, yeah. yeah. It, it's yeah. just yeah. very... It's been very it popular, and then I know we've um, offered it uh, on sale on our retail side as well. So if you manage to get a bottle, great. Uh, we don't have any to sell tonight, but there is, I think, a couple more bottles on the way um, if you are waiting on it. It's, yeah, I was expecting the Nevis to go. Nevis have been very popular, but the Del Yui, it's it's been, I think, the, the hidden gem in, in the lot here. It's the bottle that is, uh, whenever we've done a tasting, people have always been surprised 
because I suppose people don't think about value in much. I think a lot of whiskey people say, oh, yeah, I know it can be nice, whatever. But it's not a name people have on their radar too much. But it's been one that I think, you know, the price was probably quite good, which is not always what you can say about the stuff we get from Signatory. Often the price is pretty steep. But I think the price for a named 25 year old single malt that is clearly really beautiful character, quality, you know, just very high score on like the, the pleasure scale because it's under 50% natural cast strength, but not too low. So it hits that really sweet spot where it's it's quite robust in the mouth, nice mouth filling, satisfying feeling and texture on the palate, but it's not so strong that you feel you need to add water. It's danger juice. It's the stuff you just suddenly, you know, you have a, a mini dram at night and then realize that a third of the bottle has disappeared somehow. So um yeah, it's just one of those mysteriously evaporating whiskies that we can never explain. Um, so next up is the Orkney Sponge. So this is Orkney Sponge, yeah. When I first saw the labels for this, I was like, oh, that looks kind of familiar. Um, and now I know on the back of one of the bottles, it's a little bit of an homage to the old Orkney labels from yeah. Orkney McPhail. I've only well, ever yeah. So GNM, yeah, GNM yeah. did own it for a while, but before that, it was um, Stromness Distillery in the yeah. So this is this is really the the original Old Orkney um, yeah. series that was owned by uh, Stromness Distillery on Orkney, which closed in the twenties, and so I called GNM up uh, a couple of years ago now and said, "Look, I know you own this brand." Um, could I buy it off you? You've not done anything with it since the 90s. And even then it was just a blend. And they said, yeah, sure. Which I did I did not expect them to actually sell it, but they did. And it was very cool. So the reason I love this brand is that I think it was one of the very first brands that did something. And I think it was really ahead of its time in the sort of late 19th century into the early 20th century. They did fun. They didn't do stuff that was boring. They did fun. They did silly. They did... Um, original artworks uh, there's lots of if you google old orkney stromness there's loads of cool posters and it's like really romantic or really funny and or just you know playful silly so that sense of fun is so synonymous with what i'm trying to do with decadent drinks you know like we care a lot about quality and what goes into the bottle and we work really hard and we think deeply about that but presentationally and sort of philosophically we really don't think that we need whiskey or life should be taken as seriously as it often is like life is fucking hard let's try and have some fun along the way and that's very much what we're about and that i thought was you know a lot of that inspiration came from how much i love the old orkney stuff so we bought the brand and i've just really now gotten around to doing some stuff with it because i was waiting to find some decent orkney casks i could have done something sooner but just it just didn't have the bandwidth so just started doing that so the first bottling in the orkney sponge series was a highland park 98 and then we started to do these um, Orkney malts. So they're not named, but they are Highland Park, essentially. So um, we've done two here, number two and number three. So Orkney Sponge 2 is a 2005 refill hogshead, and Orkney Sponge 3 is a 2006 refill hogshead. They're both 16 years old. Uh, the key difference, I would say, between them is number five is a little more, like, naked. So more towards the kind of coastal style of Highland Park, which is uh, very fresh, quite chalky, more mineral, a little more um, sort of salty. And, and the peat smoke in there is a little lighter and a bit more drying. Whereas number three, the 2006, I think that's a bit richer. You've got a little bit more activity from the cask. So it's a little sweeter, a little more rounded. And then they were both reduced quite a bit. Not quite a bit. I mean, they were both well over 60% natural cast strength. And for the 2005, we brought that one down to um, 55%. Because I think with a drier, more coastal style like that, it suits lower strengths a bit more because I think it brings out a more aromatic side. It's a more complex cask, so you get more little details and little nuances and these kind of coastal chalky mineral qualities and the sort of citrus tones that are in there that comes through more clearly at that kind of sort of mid-range ABV. Whereas the sweeter one, this 2006, it's a, it's a fuller body, generally more rounded whiskey and it's sort of more broadly spread across different flavor characteristics of Highland Park. So you've got more of that Highland Park heather honey character in there, for example. 
And I think that naturally suits a slightly chunkier strength. So we didn't reduce that one as much. That one is at my kind of favorite strength of 100 proof, 57.1. So I just did that, boom, 100 proof, and it worked very well, I think. Um, it's quite amazing the difference trying those at cast strength and um, the samples versus what comes out in the bottle once you've reduced. It's so much better. Uh, the, the, that little bit of reduction just by a few degrees makes such a difference to the final product. Um, and these are two really good examples of where that practice is. Um, it delivers a very strong final result, I think. Um, so it's really interesting to see what you guys are going to feedback trying them side by side, because I actually haven't done this since um, since we bottled them. Uh, but I, again, this is coming back to the Sodas whiskies I love. Like The reason this is a separate series is because I'm totally in love with Orkney single malts, Highland Park and Scapa, because they are their own style. When I think of Orkney, I think of soft heathery peat and heather honey and the sea. And what Highland Park at its best, even now, this is what I don't understand, right? These bottlings are better than official Highland Parks and they should not be. There is no excuse for that. What are they doing? Why are they putting out like just, I don't know, whiskies yeah. which are not, in my mind, evocative of Orkney in a way that I think a lot of the stuff they sell onto the broker's market that we're getting, these unnamed Orkney malts are. They're much more kind of pure, vivid expressions of their distillate that they make, because the distillate that Edrington makes at Highland Park is still one of the great distillates in Scotland. Beautiful. Uh, the fact they still have their own peat source, which is incredibly distinctive, their own maltings, which use which they use quite significantly. They make a, a, a meaningful proportion of their own malt there, using a, a lot of the time using a variety called tartan, which is grown on Orkney. So you're really moving towards a concept of terroir, which is quite strong. And they tend to mix that heavily peated Orkney malt with uh, malt that they buy in from the mainland. So that becomes like the mash bill for the making of Highland Park. And when you put that spirit into just plain refill wood for 16 years, you know, you get results like this, which I think are very individualistic and very satisfying to sip. And this is these are really whiskies, which I think are, you know, pour into a good nosing glass and just sip, sip. You've got room to reduce a little bit. So again, we're coming back to this idea that they're really about pleasure. Um, two wrapped up in the Viking motif. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, how many how many Vikings must there be left? I mean, I feel like every single Viking has had his own fucking bottling by now. So, well, I do um, feel like their their um their heritage and everyone on the island having bloody Scandinavian surnames and stuff like that. I got to meet um I think Eric Anderson Masterson or something like that years and years yeah. ago. And um, yeah, they're very yeah. into that. I do get it. Uh, I just suppose that if it was me, I would be more pushing the the, the more like ancient aspects of Orkney history. Because Orkney, I think people forget, Orkney is really like the cradle of civilization in Britain. The Ring of Brodker and a lot of the original Neolithic um, you know, sites out there predate Stonehenge. The culture that built Stonehenge originated in Orkney you know this is really an incredibly important and a deeply ancient incredible place that's so well preserved in some respects that is the culture that I would be celebrating on the bottlings and I think the the fact that it's so embedded in nature in the physical nature of it and if you've ever been to Orkney I would urge you to go if you're in the Scotland and you have a chance to visit Orkney I would urge you to go um if you ever go there on a blustery autumn day and stand on the cliffs of Yesnaby and drink an, a beautiful 25 year old Highland Park, you will feel the tears coursing down your cheeks, probably because the sea is in your face, but it's <laughs> truly a vivid and intense and profound experience. And that is something that I would be looking to capture in my um, story, my promotion, my marketing materials if I were in charge of Highland Park. I'm not in charge of Highland Park yet, but maybe one day <laughs> I will be. And when I am, there'll be some changes, I can tell you. I'll cross my fingers for you. But yeah, no, yeah. I, um, I, I know what you mean. I Sometimes you go to those locations as places and you stand there and you're like, I understand why they thought like there were gods in the clouds. I understand every aspect of how, you know, the ancient mythological, you know, 
aspects came about. I had that experience in Greece when, during a thunderstorm in Sparta and it was like, oh yeah, there's a dude up there. Like, <laughs> this is, you know, and it, it really ties you in with like the story of, of the, the place. And honestly, Highland Park, I, I agree. The regular Highland Park just has no distillery character to it. It, it feels like they want to hide that character, but this, like, I've always gotten salted orange candy off of Highland yeah. Park. There's always this orange peel, candied orange peel thing to it that is just, like, smoked or salted and stuff like that, and the honey as well, and I love that everyone's getting that, like, mineral vibe. Uh, Petco, exceptionally mineral, delicious hints of sea, salt water, long finish, says Barry, um, aromatic, heathery malt. Um, Chris has only bought IB. Highland Park for the past few years and yeah I think that yeah no I think it's, it's one of those weird situations where the indies are doing more interesting and I think more authentic mm. uh, stuff which is more true to the distillery character than the distillery is but that's a story which is you know the same many times over at a lot of distilleries nowadays a lot of companies which is a shame but I suppose it's the difference between um between what we are trying to do as companies and what they're trying to do as companies they're dealing with you know tens of thousands of units going into supermarkets and much thinner margins and they're dealing with you know i'd love to see the spreadsheets and the unit economics behind highland park and i you know it also doesn't make sense and it concerns me that i can so if i want to buy uh orkney malt unnamed highland park from just plain wood will cost me more than if I just go around all the supermarkets and get 200 bottles of Highland Park 12 year old, which I can go out and buy for like 25 to 30 pounds in the supermarkets. And I could just then fill a, why am I not doing this? I could just then put a, <laughs> fill in a button in my garage. I already have three casks in my garage, by the way. Um, it's like, I call it warehouse one. Um, I said, I've been saving all the, because I have so many samples and because I do, um, I write notes and reviews as well and people send me all sorts of stuff so so much more whiskey than I would I might be dead if I tried to drink it all so uh, since 2016 I've basically been accumulating all my excess good quality sink Scottish single malts into like a third fill ex Kalila sherry butt in my garage and one day I will become like a, a private blended malt bottling um I don't know I'm gonna keep it it's like a third full there's a lot in there no idea what I'm gonna do with it um so yeah, question for Angus. Is Highland Park the most IB of all Scottish whiskies, including the underscores Orkney releases? I'd say Kalila probably more so than um, Highland Park, but because there's been such a glut of Highland Park onto the um, onto the market in recent years through these unnamed Orkney malts, that maybe they're catching up. Let's just very quickly just check whiskey base. Um, yeah, because I, yeah. I feel like we've we've been spoiled in the last couple of years. We're still feeling the um because when Entrington took over in 2017, they were like, we're gonna use more sherry in the core. So it was like all these bourbon casks can go on to you know uh brokers and and into the IBs. So we've just been in flux yeah. with all this amazing Highland Park, and now we're like, why would we buy the OBs? Like, why would we buy the regular stuff? Look how delicious this is. So I think they might have accidentally shot themselves in the foot a bit there in terms of <laughs> especially those well like they're they're raining it in now it's going to be very difficult to get more because i think they've they start they, st they were selling it as orkney malt yeah. and they've stopped labeling the casks as that they're now labeling them uh, they labeled them as island malt mm -hmm. in order to try and prevent which is such bullshit you know you you expect a higher price and you want to limit people's ability to use the origin details, which will help them sell it. So no, you have to have a harder job to sell it and you've got to pay a heart. This is what I mean by, they put the 12 year old in the shops for 25 pounds and then they are putting the back of the independent bottling market. This is something which is a phenomenon which is going on with all these distilleries. All these distilleries with brands that were built for them in the 90s and 2000s by independent bottlers they're now cashing in on that and turning off the tap and shutting out indie bottlers but they still every time they need cash it's like okay well we'll sell you some but you can't use the name and you're incredibly limited and you've got to pay this eye-watering price for it 
it stinks and they're making oceans of the stuff you know these distilleries have thousands and thousands of casks of these makes at all sorts of ages that they could be selling they don't need it all for themselves they just don't get me started bunch of fucking charlatans anyway yeah um, do you you think um Do you think there'll be a move by IBs like with Williamson to kind of try and skirt that to keep bottling it, come up with a well, name? Well, what we do, well, I, I'll show you what we do. Um, hopefully they're going to let me use this label in a bottle. Um, do you want to see some uh, upcoming, or I, I, I can show you more upcoming sponge labels if you want, but um, I'll show you in particular um, one where we're not allowed. So this is a space side single malt it's anonymous not allowed to say what it is um but let's see if you can guess from the label that i've done for it so let me see share screen here do, 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 do. Uh, is that it share allow zoom oh god i've got to open i don't know it won't let me share <laughs> while stengus um, right. is pulling that up uh i actually asked sir jam who from whiskey farm which angus writes about um the same question, how many IBs? And he said, Coila, Coila, number one, about 800. He's rated Bowmore's uh, 700, Klein Leash is 600, um, uh, Ardmore or something, Ardbeg, one of those two are in the in the 500s as well. And, and then Glenn Farkless, I think, is quite highly ranked, maybe because of the, and, and both Glenn Livid as well. But yeah, um, Highland Park, I think, is about 400, 450 from memory. He, he's yeah. rated himself. Um, so it is popular. It's not the most popular, but it's up there. Yeah. Oliver, I'm just going to send you. Um, I'm just going to send you a file here because I've got something wrong with my laptop, which won't let me share things, which is extremely annoying. Probably so, your uh, firewall. Are you emailing it or messaging it? Now this um, is an IT class, apparently. I'll just. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, bad. I'll just. I'll just drop you it in um, on maybe. Facebook is easiest. Hang on just quickly because I appreciate this is very boring for everyone to watch me grappling with technology like a, a 2001 technology, 2001. Right. Um, so that's, that's the one in question. And then I'll send you one more for, uh, so if you share that file I just sent you, um, yep, just you can it. see that you can see the, what, what I'm talking about with, uh, the way we tend to get around these various issues with naming distilleries. So we, we've obviously mentioned Orkney refers to both um, distilleries on, on the most northern part of Scottish um, islands. Um, what I did want to highlight is if something happened at some point, um, Edredor decided to change the recipe of Highland Park and they dumped so many good bourbon casks onto the, the IB market, which um, like yourself and other IBs have been catching in purchasing at um, great prices and, and bottling for us, which is why we we have so, so much range of great Highland Park whiskies is because the parent company made this decision at some point, no, we're going to focus heavily on sherry cask whiskies and, and we don't need as much bourbon stock. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, what else have we got here? Uh, it was a bit naughty and blended the last bits two, three together. Yeah, I, I do that all the time. Just if I've got several whiskies that are similar, I just uh, slosh them together at the end of a tasting and results are usually pretty good. Um, are secret scappers labeled as Orkney malts? Well, no. Scapa is very tightly controlled by Pernod Ricard and they don't make much of it. And it's also one which the blenders are fanatical about using. Uh, which is a shame. Scap is one of those whiskies, which is, I don't understand why they don't do more with it because it's such a, it's a gorgeous name. It's a gorgeous distillery. Um, it does make a lovely whiskey. It's, it's much softer than Highland Park, but it still has a lot of that kind of nice Orkney Heather honey vibe. Um, so, all right. So this is the, this is actually the Legig we are bottling. Um, so this was just one I sent you as like a, um, a little heads up as to something that's coming up. So this is the one that you got particularly excited about, Oliver which is the um, very dark, juicy, uh, sherry matured legig, which is done at kind of natural cast strength. Um, so this is uh, coming up in uh, just about, it's been bottled and it's just about to arrive with us. So this is the label for that. I just thought share is a little heads up. And then the other one I sent you is the Space Side uh, 2003. So if, if you can guess what distillery this is from, then uh, uh, you don't you do not win a prize because it should be somewhat obvious 
So this is going to be a rate available, uh, assuming the butler accepts this label, which I think they will. Um, this should be available, uh, say, November time, later this later next month. Yeah. So this is actually ob obviously Glen Grant. Uh, it's very a very lovely 2003 example, which has got a very light trace of peat to it from a lightly peated batch. And uh, this will be available, um, as I said, later in November. Uh, so this is, yeah, just a really nice little cask we managed to nab. So yeah, a couple of uh, upcoming sponges. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, so generally people, I would say, any more silent distilleries in future released from the sponge? Well, um, we are working on something that will be very expensive, which is uh, Mostawi 1979, uh, which is the last cask that Signatory had. I think there's only 69 bottles come out of the cask. And unfortunately, given the pricing these days, that's going to be like a, a four figure price tag, unfortunately. Um, but it was the sort of toss up of, well, there's only 69 bottles. And, you know, what, what are we going to do? You know, I, I would I would quite like to have a Mostoe 79. So the plan is to do that in the same presentation we did the Glen Grant 73 in the kind of really elegant hand-blown cognac style glass. And that'll be a sponge special edition, maybe early next year that will be released. Um, any other silent distilleries? Uh, we may do some more Capra Donich at some point. I don't know. That's an option potentially um and do, 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 do. is there anything else i need to check i don't think so i really want to find an imperial because i've got a really nice label idea in my head for like a sort of nazi sponge theme like the imperial kind of uh dystopian you know, like Big brother vibe and i really um i mean nazi sponge sounds like a quite amusing series anyway which i would uh, not get away with uh but yeah imperial would be very cool um, and if I can find a cask, then fingers crossed. But it seems it seems unlikely at the moment. Um, Don't then, mention the war. You know, well, the war of the indie bottlers trying to get casks. Uh, any other questions there? No. So shall we move on to the Kalila? Yeah, the Kalila, which I have to say, this is probably one of my favourite labels that you've ever done and probably one of oh, my cool. favourite pack labels as well. I um. <laughs> and we'll, we'll read out the back label just because I, I keeled over laughing um, from I it. I, I the black label now. It was a cocktail recipe, wasn't it? Yeah, like a, yeah. a riff on the Corpse Reviver number two. Oh, yeah. Um, I, um, <laughs> well, it's to the Kalila. I, I'm glad you like the label. That's really one of my favorites as well. I adore these kind of old Belle Epoque absinthe style um, themes. And that was really a, an, a chance to riff on that. So, the Kalila is just, I mean, every so often I think, hmm, it's been a while since we bottled a Kalila, we should probably bottle another one. So this was a really lovely cask that we found in the warehouse of Signatory once again, and it's a 2009 second fill sherry, but I think sherry and peat is a bit of a challenge sometimes to get them to knit together in a balanced way can be quite tough. Uh, but second fill uh, really worked here because it was still reasonably active, but not over the top. So you get this lovely rounded harmonious fusion of like soft, like quite earthy, like quite salty sherry that paired perfectly with Kalila's distillate. So you get a really clear, lovely, um, that, that lovely salty, pure um, medicinal Kalila profile with lovely kind of modern um, slightly sharp, pure peatiness. But around that was this sort of nice balanced leathery sherry. And that just, you know, full term maturation. So it wasn't like a finish or anything. It's just this lovely integrated single flavor profile. And the thing I'm always looking for with Kalila is what can we bottle that's a little bit different? Because a lot of them are very similar. They're always great. It's such a consistent make, but there's obviously a lot of um, similarity within that. So I'm always looking for casks to express something a bit different. And this one just ticked that box. It was a really nice dram, um, very, uh, very expressive. And uh, just at the you know nice uh, perfect natural cast strength uh, and you know this time of year going into Christmas winter I mean I appreciate you guys are in the middle of summer but um, for us you know over here it's uh, absolutely perfect time of year for this 
Don't um, worry, it doesn't feel like summer here. <laughs> it's been pretty wet. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, then it's perfect. Yeah, nice soggy afternoon dram. Uh, so, yeah, not much to say. It's just a really good cask of Kalila, which I was I was very happy with and just seemed like a no brainer to, to bottle. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, again, yeah, there's a poster somewhere of mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lady in a veil uh, yeah. holding up a glass of absinthe. That is quite a sort of iconic absinthe poster, um, Belle Epoque style. And this is the was the inspiration for this label. And we always feature the Coonicorn on these labels, the Helan Coonicorn, which is um, uh, always the sponge's co-companion for any time we bottle Kalila. You'll no notice every Kalila bottling it features. So, uh, so yeah, I hope you all enjoy it. Um, I have to ask, is like the cunicorn like our version of drop bears? Is it like a thing in Scotland? No, it's just, or is it just you? No, it's just there's a there's a um heel and coos, which are pretty synonymous with Scotland. And my brain just one day went, what would coo coonicorn? Put a horn on a coo. Ha ha, ha that's funny. <laughs> Let's do that. There's literally just an idea that pops into my head when I was trying to think of what to do for our first Kalila bottling label. And I thought, let's do that. And then when the second bottling came around, I said, like, right, let's make this a, a, a recurring character in the Sponge universe. Yeah. So what, Emma, you, you want to read the back? Well, I bloody can't. It's not zoomed in close enough. And my eyes are terrible. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, the poster that you guys are probably familiar with is a 19, is an 1896 uh, Absinthe Robert. Um, so for a little bit of background, um, one of the venues that I worked in for a long time was a premier Absinthe bar in Melbourne and um, so I have this absolutely deep-seated love for absinthe and absinthe is included in the corpse reviver number two cocktail and this is how to mix the perfect sponge reviver number 66. Take three bottles of Kulila 2009, drink one and place the other on your shelf just in case, decant third bottle into a shaker, invite your friends around, agitate the shaker by lashing it to your head and undertaking an immense week and long bender with frequent bouts of break dancing, telling your friends to leave. <laughs> That's what got me. I'm like, yeah, bugger off. <laughs> um, but yeah, while well, you simultaneously eat crystal and stuff, I, I love it. Um, not a great I'm pleased you enjoyed the rear it. labels because I think the, that's the one thing that sort of gets a bit lost in what we do. I don't, we don't promote the rear labels or draw much attention to them. It's just meant to be like a, a little something extra for some, if you've bought a bottle, it's, you know, to have a dram and have a, hopefully have a little giggle at home that's it's it, it's really just goes back to what i was saying about you know within the confines of just you know anyone can pick a nice dram and shove it in a bottle so it's like you know let's tick that box and do that job and try and do it really well but beyond that what else can we do with with just labels so it's really trying to just do go the extra mile so i'm pleased you enjoy the rear labels because uh, uh, that's quite fun favorite. writing them when we when we showcased um, the sponge at the Oak Barrel Fair, I got full on, you know, theater kids soliloquy reading the back of the Jura label. You know, it was it was fantastic. People loved it. And I think, you know, um, I when I first was introduced to your brand, I was like, what is this queefing stroganoff tasting note? Yeah. Like, who is this? What is going on? And and from there, I'm like, yeah, the front's great. What's what does it say on the back? <laughs> um yeah my mum once gave a bottle of one of my whiskeys to um her elderly neighbor as like a thank you for helping her with something and and she then said to me later on I did notice there was something about xenomorph hymens on the rear label I'm not sure if that's suitable for that. I was like oh yeah maybe I shouldn't have given you that one but yeah <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I I just like to try and push the boundaries. I got told off by one of my, um, so we now have a label checking procedure due to some uh, incidents. Uh, <laughs> and one of my colleagues said, uh, you, there's a drug reference there. I think you should take that off. I said, there's already a lot of drug references on the sponge labels <laughs> that in the world already. I don't think that you, I think you're a bit late. That ship has sailed, but all right, I'll change it just because anyway. So <laughs> no, I've, uh, it, yeah, I have very good, uh, very good colleagues who, help me stay out of trouble you just gotta get creative i was introduced to the term booger sugar and i've not stopped using it since um yeah i was i was trying to use the word swedgers which is uh, a scottish slang for um for ecstasy tablets on the 
favorite label of a I did a, a did a one of the upcoming rear labels features um so the the one we, we showed you the the secret space side features tasting notes by famous Scottish whiskey collector Len Grant and uh, and he's speaks his tasting notes are in a very broad rich Scottish Glaswegian vernacular uh, so this was part of that label and uh, uh, there were some edits required so yeah that's all I'll say you can look forward to reading that when bottles land in in Oz okay can I um, um just bring it back to the whiskey for a second so perfect age for a Kawila, 12 years old 56.3 percent ABV which it does not drink that like like it's just so easy on the on the mouth and I, I agree with what leo just said pete and sherry work so well it's um it's quite balanced almost an equilibrium in, in essence yeah absolutely it, it, it sits in that world i could have could have bottled this as an equilibrium three potentially but um the that thing about strength i think that's really for me a sign of a very good whiskey which is uh when you get sherry and peat together and at high strength when the when the abv is quite absorbed into the whiskey that it doesn't you don't notice it at natural strength that is always for me a you know a light bulb moment of oh this is a good dram you know it's everything's in harmony and you can still add water but there's just this immediate accessibility and beauty about it um so yeah i, I was just really happy with it i'm, I'm glad you all like it it's going to be very interesting to get your uh, feedback on the Ledger 2005 when that finally makes it over there because that's up above 62% natural cast strength and that's even more sherried but it's the same type of casks effectively second fill sherry butts but they're more active and that's a pro another level altogether so that'll be really interesting to see what everyone thinks of that because um, that's probably the one whiskey I'm kind of most excited about that we've got upcoming over the next month. Um, I'm excited about. <laughs> yeah, and we've also got the um, something else really nice, which if you like this profile, we've got um, a heavily sherried 2000 Ardmore, which has been double matured in first fill sherry. So it's free fill hogsheads, then first fill sherry for over two years. Mm -hmm. And that is very dark, like super dark. And that has this really like smoked chocolate, earthy tobacco quality. It's the Ardmore character and sherry works I think very well together so that'd be a really interesting one to get everyone's feedback on when it uh when it arrives so yeah lots of exciting stuff coming up yeah uh, so here, interesting to see the results here do, 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 do. Just give it a, one more minute while people are voting uh we do have a little special on tonight so let me just paste the link while i've got everyone's attention i will email it out anyways but we do have wonderful selection of uh sponges and decadent drinks uh in the warehouse looking for a brand new home so if you can please adopt uh will be gladly appreciated little code as a little Hi. thank you for everyone who joins tonight uh sponge 10 at a checkout and we'll look after you there as well but um just before i put the results out there's a lot of sponge and, and decadent drinks fans in the room here you can see gilly dominic paul even even leo Michael, um, what do you guys think um, tonight in terms of tasting? What's your, what's your any any sort of comments? I'm, I'm happy to turn off maybe the, the mute and see if you want to just let us know what you think. I uh, absolutely loved the Delio and it was a stunning, absolutely stunning whiskey. It's probably the pick of the night for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I really love the Dalyun as well. Uh, to me, it's just one that's, I think the easiness of it, the fact it's it's not a, a totally simple dram, it's got its little complexities and it's elegant and sort of nuanced detail, but it's really uh, so pleasurable and uh, just dangerous to drink. That kind of evaporating bottle, myster mysterious aspect about it, is, it's always a good sign for me. So I'm pleased you like that one. I love that one as well. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think Alex, yeah. you had a question earlier, Alex, uh, about the 1990 Isla casks, which I'm actually curious, did you want to ask Angus? Yeah, there just seems to be a lot of um, like 89 and 90 Isla casks that have all come to market all of a sudden. It's just kind of curious if there's any sort of backstory to that. It just seems a bit... Yeah.
Uh, it's, so not complaining, think, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there's any mystery to it. I think what it was is it's a large parcel of blending stock. I don't know who owned it originally. I've heard William Grant. I've heard Ian McLeod. But so this, the origin originally, you know, where it would have first been put together would have been Allied Distillers, which is the company uh, which dissolved in the early 2000s. And it was it was a company which owned Ardbeg and Laphroaig distilleries. So from those vintages, it can only really be Ardbeg or Laphroaig. And they don't taste like Ardbeg at all to me. So I think it, it, it can only be Laphroaig that's in those. Um, so it's a big parcel that is all from refill barrels. I've seen the casks myself. They're typical um, Allied distillers wood with painted ends, which color code them as like fourth fill casks. So uh, these, were, these were just casks which were set aside and labeled as Isla single malt, um, which is very indicative that their original intention would have been blending stock. And what's happened is they've just been sat there for quite a long time to the point that whoever owned them now clearly thought, you know what, these have got more value to be sold into the broker's market to indie bottlers than they are in our blends. So either one of these companies decided they needed cash quickly, to, so they sold this big parcel, or they just saw an opportunity and decided to take it. But what happened is the parcel was very big, got sold into the broker's market, and then they would have been sold off individually bit by bit to some indie bottlers, and then the parcel shrinks and shrinks, and then the parcel gets bought by another company and moves along. So the price then goes up again because, you know, the, the, every time it moves, there's a new tier of margin getting added into these things. So now the remnants of these stocks uh, are pretty much owned by Signatory, as far as I'm aware. There's a few other bottlers that still own them who bought them earlier on and are sitting on them, but primarily they're owned by Signatory, and we are um able to get access to a few of them so this is where the recent ones that we've done have, have come from and the quality is beautiful you know there there there's quite a lot of similarity from cask to cask because originally these would have been vatted i think what happened is maybe five to ten years ago the stock was vatted and put back into the same casks uh, but just to consolidate this the parcel and make it slightly fewer casks and put the top you know top them up to keep the the headspace low and make sure that they would um, have more maturation uh, potential. So th that has bred a little bit of similarity in the from cast to cask, but now that it's starting to diverge again because there's more and more time that they spend in these casks. And yeah, there's 89s, there's 90, 91, 92. Uh, the ones that remain, as far as I'm aware, certainly in Signatory's warehouse, is 1990 and 1991. And we've just done a uh, 1990 for Isla Sponge Part One. Uh, I've got a 1991 which should be coming out in January uh, alongside hopefully a 1991 Jura. And the plan for that is to do another A and B label. And the theme will be a sort of one giant label of the two islands fighting each other. Uh, so that's the sort of that's the plan currently. Whether it goes through and happens like that, we'll uh, we'll see. But uh, yeah, that's the story. There's, uh, there's no great mystery. It's just what often happens every few years. It's like what happened with Little Mill a few years ago, then Ben Nevis 96s, uh, the Jura 1990s casks. There's just every so often one of the big companies spits out a huge parcel and it just takes a few years to sort of sift through the industry like that. So that's what's happening. And we're at the tail end of that now. You'll see fewer and fewer of these casks coming to the market as the, over the next year, I would say. Thanks very much for that, Angus. No problem. Dominic, do you um, have a question or feedback? Uh, no, no question. Well, feedback, yes. Um, I thought it's nice to sit here and, and among those six that we had tonight, um, there's no real superstar. Like there is no, there's no whatever, 26 year old uh, spring bang. There is no, uh, which, which I do like. But what I like about- Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. What I like, I tried <laughs> to make a point saying, Despite the fact that there was no super, these, this is all very, very nice, very enjoyable, and and in their own right, absolutely gorgeous. So that's what I tried to say. So you don't need the superstars to have an awesome tasting. Oh, well, that's that's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, I might save that clip and just uh, play it as a GIF, <laughs> uh, an audio clip on our uh, on every release. But you know, that's uh, that's very good to hear. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, we. <sighs> 
the reason we you know we, we bottle quite a lot but maybe not as some others but we i really do put an effort into picking things and i don't bottle things that i don't myself enjoy to drink and you know we've turned down quite a lot of things over the years because they're often because they're too expensive but sometimes because like you know we rejected a 1995 springbank for example because it was soapy we could have bottled it and sold it but we rejected it because um you know i don't want to put my name to something that is you know gonna potentially damage our reputation damage my reputation i do care a lot about quality i'm quite sort of deeply philosophical about this concept of quality like the, in the truest sense and that's a big part of what we try to do is is uh, make sure that every release is at least interesting and will for some people be you know hopefully for most people be a really pleasurable drinking experience you know i always come back to this idea of pleasure um i don't expect everyone to open everything i i my background is old and rare whiskies and i wouldn't have been able to have those experiences if mm. people hadn't you know very selflessly died without opening all their bottles so it, it's it's very much, uh, I'm, you know, I'm very open to the idea that people keep things and want to drink them in future or that future generations might stumble across these bottlings and similarly be pleasantly surprised by the contents. So that's what I'm thinking about is that thinking about today's drinkers, but also the future's drinkers. And so, yeah, thank you. I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear that. That's cool. Thanks, Angus. Angus, have you ever like said no to a cask and then a few months later another like it's you know exactly it's popped up at another bottle and you're like that's the one i rejected that john west you know uh no but the one that tends to happen more with the ones where i can't afford I, well i don't think that we should bottle it because it's just too expensive and i'm not confident that we can sell it or and then i tend to see where it goes and then some months go by and i'm like <laughs> i wish i could have <laughs> um there was a Early on, when we when we started, there was an opportunity to do a 1979 Kalila, which was a 40 years old at the time, just turned 40, and it was so beautiful. We would have had to charge £1,500 a bottle, and at that time, there were other casks of similar whiskey sitting on shops for £1,500, quid, and I just, I just chickened out. I didn't have the confidence. Uh, I thought we would be sat on the stock for too long, and do you know what? Maybe we would have done. And I don't think there's any point of looking back and regretting all these things, but I would have loved to have found a way to be able to make it work because it's such beautiful whiskey, but it's also just so expensive. And this is the problem now. Whiskey is so expensive. And, you know, this is why I am not, um, I am not obsessive or pushy about what people do with their bottles once they've purchased them. You know, the reality, this is, and also why I think this narrative that, there's just flippers and there's just drinkers and they're all in this great big cosmic war like you know you know i don't know the evil empire and the rebel alliance it's just bollocks it's like everyone is much more nuanced than that most people are a mix of a drinker a collector and occasionally they might sell something at auction and as am i i've sold things at auction i only reason i'm able to have this house is because i managed to sell a bunch of stuff at auction to help pay for it and it's I don't think it's something that we should all be so judgmental about and all sit in all these camps and sneer at like if people want to buy a bottle of whiskey for two to three hundred pounds that is a lot of money most normal human beings would say what the actual shit are you doing that is insane and you know <laughs> it's, if people then say right well I want to buy this and I might drink it but I would also like to feel confident that I can get my money back if I need to sell it at some point in the future. That's a perfectly legitimate position to take. And so, you know, I don't get, I don't get obsessive about all that stuff. Whiskey is probably more expensive than it should be, but we have to work with the world as it is. And I still love whiskey. I still want to work with it. So I, one of the things that I accept is that it is quite expensive, more expensive than I would like it to be. And one day I hope to be able to release whiskies, which are, you know, more balanced in their pricing, but it's just going to take a while to get to that position. Um, even though I think, you know, for all we have, you know, some releases are probably a bit too expensive or more expensive than I'd like. There's plenty where I think our pricing's fine. You know, it's, it's in line with current market prices and it is what it is. So, and this is something that all independent bottlers worry about and obsess over and have their own, um, opinions on and 
ways to deal with. So yeah, it's just a part of today's market for the time being, unfortunately. Yeah, fair enough. The you know the realities of and the excitement of whiskey and money. <laughs> you know, where's yeah, the yeah, absolutely the balance between. So yeah. Um, yeah. So I will just uh, close up by saying thank you very much for everyone for coming tonight and thank you uh, to Oliver and Emma for hosting us. Um, we really are appreciative of all the work you guys do. Um, we're constantly having, every time we have a meeting every week where we go through our um, our uh, partners that we work with, our channels, and we say, whiskey list, and everyone just goes, yeah, it's fine, everything's going well there, no problems, move on, next, good. And so <laughs> it is exactly what we want. And so you guys are... Uh, there's a note under that that says send them more whiskey <laughs> well you know absolutely there's more whiskey for you here if you if you desire it just let us know um no we you know we really appreciate what you guys do for us and it's really nice to have feedback like this and to do tastings like this so um yeah and it's it's mad for me you know humbling to think that bottles that we worked hard to create are being enjoyed on the other side of the planet so that's really cool um yeah so thank you very much and, and nice to see you all of you what one day we're all gonna um flip our zoom upside down just just to uh, mess with you <laughs> i mean we will i will get around to doing like a, a proper like traditional boring um sort of stereotypical upside down label for for uh new zealand at uh, new zealand australia at some point um <laughs> so yeah that's that just offended you all there again as well um, no 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 we like we like the kiwis and are you coming to jam fest <laughs> and stopping over in, in melbourne or sydney by any chance i'd love to one day it's just the my problem is i uh well first of all i've got a baby daughter and if i just jet off to the other side of the world for a month then uh, i would probably come back and find them gone i don't know and but dave, dave broom dave broom came to the last one and he brought the family and uh, he i think they loved it so much they stayed for three months uh, i mean covid didn't allow them to go back but that was a story. <laughs> yeah but dave, dave broom's like 80 years old and his children are all like grown-ups and so that is you know i've a 10 month I, the thought of taking my 10 month old daughter on a flight to australia i think i would rather drink loch do i mean it's, it's <laughs> Sounds like literally terrifying. Um, but one day I will 100% come out. I, my family, you know, my parents spent a lot of time in uh, Melbourne. Uh, they used to work, live and work out there. Uh, it's on my bucket list to go out there and sort of do a little bit of a sort of pilgrimage to their old haunts and also to go and visit, um, you know, the really cool bars out there. Like I, I really want to go and visit um, Whiskey and Ailment, for example. Obviously, want to visit you guys, do a tasting in person, and um, want to go and visit Tasmania. That's one of my just places I generally want to go and visit, and uh, not just for the distilleries, but just really want to go and see it. So, 100%, it's just going to have to be a time where I can come out for maybe, maybe like at least two weeks, maybe three, and uh, just try and absorb being jet lagged for like 50% of that time because I'm terrible with jet lag and I'm just completely clobbers me so you can expect me to be hosting a tasting and just having a nap between drams you talk amongst yourselves <laughs> we, we will we will get you here one day i keep asking yeah I, I will <laughs> yeah no i 100 percent will be coming out there at some point and um, it's you guys are uh, at the top of my list of places i would really like to come visit um, and i mean that so you know we, it will happen um whether or not i come out with uh, molly and lucy in tow uh, which would require probably its own complex organizational matrix to make happen. But yeah, we'll make it work sooner or later, I promise. Yeah. On that note, thank you, Angus, so much for your time, mate. Um, an hour and a half, um, you know, more than we, we deserve down here, but we always appreciate your time. Thanks so much. We'll, we'll definitely no see you at the next tasting. At the no, next it's no tasting. problem. It's just what happens when I when I start wittering on without an off switch. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your patience. And, uh, yeah, nice to see you all and uh, look forward to the next one. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Take care. Cheers, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.